Good afternoon, my name is Tammy and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Health Share Exchange Introduction to P3N conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. Pam Clark, Senior Director of Health Share Exchange, you may begin your conference. Thank you, Tammy, and welcome everyone to the Health Share Introduction to P3N. As Tammy mentioned, I'm the Senior Director here at Health Share Exchange, and with me I have the Executive Director, Martin Lupinetti. We have our intern, Matthew Bastian. Daniel Wilt, who will also be presenting with me today, is our Senior Director of Information Technology, and our Administrative Assistant, Angela McNamee, here is at the office with us. On the line for HealthShare Exchange, we have our legal counsel, Helen Oshislavsky and Jill Osirkis. In addition, we have presenting to us this afternoon from the PA eHealth Partnership Authority, Alan Price, who's a technical architect, and Kay Schaefer, the P3N System and Certification Manager. I wanted to let everyone know that this program will be recorded so we can make it available to those who are not able to be on the call today. This is a WebEx, and on the WebEx there is a chat function. If you have questions during the presentation, feel free to type your question to everyone, and we will try to field those questions as we go. However, know that there will be a question and answer time at the end of the presentation, we have allotted about 10 to 15 minutes for question and answers. So without further ado, uh, I will walk you through our agenda and we will start the program. So you will hear this afternoon about the authority, who the authority is, and what the P3N is. We will hear about the services that are provided through the P3N including the Public Health Gateway. There will be a description of how the Master Patient Index is established and the ability for patients to be discovered and determined through the Health Information Exchange. We will describe the consent management approach that is used in compliance with Act 121. Also, both the authority and HSX will describe how our provider directories work individually and in concert with one another. You will hear about the certification process that is underway as HSX is in the process of becoming certified by the authority for participation with the P3N. And ultimately, we hope by the end of the program, you will have an understanding of the value and benefits for HSX's participation with the P3N as we continue to determine that option for our health information exchange. Last but not least, we will ask you for your support in legislative advocacy so that hopefully the legislators will see fit to ensure that there is the appropriations needed to continue the authority and uh, the P3N for the services. Finally, we will have a question and answer session, as I've already mentioned. So, Kay Schaefer, I will turn the program over to you. Thank you so much, Pam, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to see we've got so many people that were able to join us on this call today. I want to start in with introducing the authority and our background and some information on how we got here. Through an exhaustive effort, the stakeholder community came together in about 2011 to develop our first strategic and operational plans. This group recommended pursuing legislation that would create a health information exchange authority as a governing entity. As a result of these efforts, Senate Bill 8 was introduced early in 2012, and thanks to the efforts and strong support of our stakeholder community, Senate Bill 8 passed unanimously in both the House and the Senate on June 27 of 2012. Then on July 5 of 2012, Governor Corbett signed into law Act 121, 
of 2012. We're moving to slide five now. Act 121 designated the Pennsylvania eHealth Partnership Authority, or known simply as the Authority, as an independent state agency to be governed by a board of directors. The board consists of 15 members and two ex officio non-voting members. These members include the secretaries or their designated representatives from the Pennsylvania Department of Health and the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services, a representative of the healthcare community who is focused on the unserved or underserved population, a physician or a nurse, a hospital representative, an insurance representative, a representative of an assistant living residence, personal care home, long-term care nursing facility, continuing care facility, or behavioral or mental health facility, two consumer representatives, representatives of the health information organization community. Three are appointed by the House and three are appointed by the Senate. Act 121 also laid out a number of tasks and requirements of the authority, including those you see on this slide. The authority was charged with developing, establishing, and maintaining a statewide electronic health information exchange to promote efficient and effective communication among healthcare providers, payers, participants, to create efficiencies and promote accurate delivery of health care, and support the ability to improve community health status. It requires us to develop and maintain a directory of health care providers' contact information to enable participants to share health information electronically, to develop and maintain standards to ensure interoperability, develop and maintain a registry of patients choosing to opt out of health information exchange, along with procedures to re-enroll into that exchange, to develop criteria for the approval of participants in this HIE, and this is the certification package that we'll speak to later in the presentation. Act 121 also requires the authority and its board to establish and collect fees to sustain the services that are being provided, to establish advisory groups, and to elect two ex officio board members, develop and conduct public information programs to educate and inform consumers and patients about health information, and to submit an annual report to the governor and the legislature that includes the activities of the authority for that year, such as expenditures, a list of contracts, and a summary of any reported breaches. Moving on to slide six, so who exactly is the authority? The organization chart on this slide is currently being updated, so some of the information you see here is a bit out of date. But as you can see, we do have an executive director and a chief counsel who both report directly to the board and who, along with the deputy director, manage the work being performed by a variety of employees. In our current organization, the role of the privacy officer is also assumed by our chief counsel. That work is supported by a policy manager. We do have a press secretary and administrative assistant who both report to the executive director, but the business analyst role you see here has not been filled. There is a program manager and a technical architect who both report directly to the deputy director. The program manager directs the work of the administrative officer and a contracted legislative liaison. The fund development role is no longer a part of our organization. The technical architect manages a business analyst, which replaces the system administrator role you see here, and two contracted staff members supporting the public health gateway. The IT policy and procurement manager role was eliminated. So that's a brief overview of how we're set up as an office. Let's move on to slide seven. And this then is a brief overview of the P3N. It shows very, very high level view 
of the Nature of Health Information Exchange in Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania Patient and Provider Network, which is known as the P3N, acts really as a hub of connections for any of the HIOs wishing to exchange information with each other. The HIOs may connect either as an XDS participant or as an XCA participant. An XDS participant being a cross-community document sharing standard developed by um, an organization known as Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise, or IHE. Um, I'm not going to go into technical details on the two types, but wanted to give you some information there. XCA is known as cross-community access, again, an IHE standard. Both of these types of participants will have full access to the P3N services, but the XDS participants will be contributing to a record locator service, whereas the XCA participants will not. XCA participants will establish a connection to the P3N as well as to each other um, within the XCA participants. It's important to note that the P3N does not store any of the clinical data. It only acts as the pipes that connect these organizations and allow the health information exchange. As you can see on this slide, we have two XDS participants. The St. Luke's University Health Network is currently live in the P3N. They went live last fall. And we have Tapestry, who's planning on being live this fall, uh, probably in the November timeframe. We also have three XCA participants. We have Health Share Exchange, who is currently in the onboarding process and is hoping to be live by October of this year. And we have Clinical Connect, hoping to be live by November. And Kihai, um, who is looking at this year, but we're still determining their actual dates. There are a couple of other participants who have shown interest in joining the community, but they're still in very early discussions yet. And we have several neighboring states who wish to connect with us this year that are not yet represented on this slide as those conversations are still in the early phases. On slide eight, we provide a view of the services that are available and kind of the network itself. The bottom box on this slide represents the foundation of health information exchange in Pennsylvania and includes the patients, providers, pharmacies, labs, and other organizations and entities that are directly involved in the care of the patients. These entities connect to certified HIOs for access to the P3N services. And those services are represented here as the red buckets within the blue box. These services include the provider directory, the master patient index, the record locator services, opt-out registry, and the public health gateway. And we will talk more about these in our upcoming slides. Although not currently in place today, our contract vendor, Truven Health Analytics, will allow us to also connect to the Healthy Way for access to federal agency exchanges, as well as potentially to other states and territories. Moving to slide nine, with that background in place, let's start looking at some of the services themselves, which are being provided by the P3N. The first is the Public Health Gateway, or the PHG. The PHG is a very important part of the puzzle as it enables a secure, single point of submission for public health reporting through the HIOs to the state agencies. The authority is currently testing the exchange for electronic lab reporting and clinical quality measures, or CQM reporting, and both of these services are expected to be fully live and available in July of this year. Following that, access to the Department of Health's immunization registry and cancer reporting 
are expected to be available in the August time frame of this year, followed by access to syndromic surveillance in September of this year. The authority is also seeking additional federal grants for next year, which, if received, would be used to make this public health gateway functionality bi-directional, meaning not only would entities be able to submit data to those state agency registries, they would also be able to pull information from them. And we also hope at some point in the near future to be able to provide access to additional state agencies and their registries. It is important to note with the Public Health Gateway that all data is securely transmitted from the HIOs to the Public Health Gateway itself. At no time are messages opened or viewed until they arrive at their final destination at the state agency. So we'll move to slide 10, which gives you a pictorial view of the workflow and the data flow of public health messages. Messages are passed from a provider's EHR, or electronic health record system, to the HIO they participate with. While you see the authority represented here in this diagram, the authority provides the onboarding and governance for the public health gateway but we do not intercept or interact with the messages being sent. We do not hold the clinical data. We do not open the messages. Those messages go directly to the Commonwealth Electronic Data Exchange, or SEDEX, which sits within the Department of Human Services. If the message is for CQM reporting, it will be sent directly on to that registry within the Department of Human Services. All other messages would be sent to the Department of Health's Message Processing Gateway, or MPG. The MPG then further disseminates that message to the appropriate message or appropriate registry within the Department of Health. On slide 11, we move into another key component of health information exchange, which is the Master Patient Index and patient discovery. The P3N includes an enterprise level MPI, Master Patient Index, which provides a global patient identifier. Our MPI is fed by data from the Pennsylvania Department of Health's Immunization Registry, the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services MPI, and from the MPIs of our connected HIOs. This enterprise-level MPI enables patient consent management in support of our Act 121 requirements. The MPI provides seamless patient matching at the P3N level based on all available demographic information and enables matching of patients with medical records that are maintained by disparate systems. While the MPI may be accessed via separate P3N provider portal, it does also allow seamless access from the provider's EHR system. With only one HIO currently live in the P3N, the MPI today contains over 6 million patients, and we currently have only eight patients who have opted out. This brings us to slide 12. In managing patient consent, Limited authority staff have access to the MPI via the P3N provider portal. This access is for administrative purposes only, and it allows us to fulfill our requirements under Act 121, which includes the ability to notify patients that their consent status has changed. The authority's technology vendor has access to the MPI for maintenance purposes. One example where there may be this type of access for maintenance purpose would be if an authorized P3N user signs two entries in the MPI and has positively confirmed that they are a definite match, a support ticket would be issued to Truven, who would then link the patients in the P3N MPI. 
all other patient matching is handled seamlessly by the system using an algorithm that is based on all available demographics. When a query is made to the P3N MPI, the system will return all consent documents that are associated with that patient. These entries are then dated to ensure that the requester may choose the most recent document available. Provided that the patient has not opted out, the system will then provide a list of documents that are available from all of the XDS participants, and it will contain a list of patient IDs from other XCA participants who also have that patient registered in their systems. As a result, the requester may then choose to request a document from an XDS participant, or if the requester is an XCA participant, they may request a list of documents available from other XCA participants. I'm going to move on now to slide 13 and let Daniel Wilt speak a bit more about the HSX-specific MPI. Daniel? Yes, so um, part of the, our effort with uh, HealthShare Exchange is to get connected with their uh, registration pieces to register our patients in, inside of the, the statewide MPI, and so that'll be happening over the summer when we'll start doing testing around that. But this is just the number of uh, patients that have been growing in our MPI. So far, we're up over 600,000 now. Uh, the gross is the number of entities that overall, and then the net is actually the number of uh, unique uh, entities that are inside the MPI. And so uh, this is growing rather fast. Um, we had a couple of big loads uh, from a couple of the payers that really kicked up uh, 400,000. Uh, and then from the ADT fees that we've been receiving since March, uh, this is actually growing about between eight and 10,000 unique entities a day, uh, to be honest, and keeping track and uh, watching the numbers uh, as they grow. So um, obviously uh, the Philadelphia, the Southeast Philly region is about 4 million. And then you add in South Jersey, it's another 2 million. That a good portion of them come across the bridge for, for health services. And so uh, we think the total uh, population is probably around six is what we expect to be kind of fully built out. Uh, and so we're quickly getting to some uh, quick MPI numbers that are getting us close to that 6 million. So uh, that's any, just that, that's the update from HSX. Okay, this is Pam Clark, and I'd just like to interrupt at this moment to see if we can take a pause and see if Tammy can open up the option for participants to ask questions, since you covered a lot of information. So I think before we go through the next set of information for on the agenda that we would allow for some questions at this moment. Excellent. Okay, at this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, Press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. Again, that is star number one. Okay, and your first question comes from the line of Andrew Farella. Hello. Just um, could you please repeat the distinction between XDS participants and XC? A participants, I, I just didn't quite understand the distinction, um, and it went a little too fast for me. If you could just repeat that, please. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Thank you. XDS participants um, actually make a single connection to the P3N. They do register their clinical documents in our record locator service which is basically a card catalog of records that are available. We do, again, we do not hold the clinical data at the P3N. So when an XDS participant uh, queries for records, all of their queries do pass through the P3N itself. With an XCA participant, they're still going to use our master patient index. They're still using the P3N for consent management but they're not actually registering their documents in our record locator service. So the P3N acts as a gateway between those two types of participants. Um, for instance, the XCA participant, if they want to query a document, and if you see on this um, particular slide here, 
if a provider within HSX is trying to query a document from St. Luke's, who is an XDS, that query would pass through the P3N's gateway. However, if a provider at HSX would like to query for documents that are at Clinical Connect, HSX and Clinical Connect would have a direct um, connection there amongst themselves. The P3N would simply provide you with the patient IDs of the other XCA participants who may have information on that patient. Does okay, that I'd like to, help you out? Yeah. Okay, I'd like to just jump in too. And so to answer your question, Andy, we have a choice. We can either choose to do an XDS connection or XCA connection. We chose the XCA connection because it's less information that we register with the state, so we aren't registering any documents uh, with the state that actually saying with us. And so as a decision point for HSX, we wanted to make sure that we minimize the amount of stuff that we were passing up there and, and also to have the same functionality, uh, both work uh, the same way in the fact that we get the information across the network, but it just works in two different ways. That, that's very helpful. Thank you for that clarification. Any other okay. questions, Tammy? Yes, your next question comes from the line of Gordon Zeese. Can you hear me? Gordon, mm -hmm. good afternoon. Hi, I'm actually not asking the question Laura Rip is. Hi. Okay, hi, Laura. Hello, hello. Um, just wanted to get some details on the software that you're using, that middleware piece that um, adjudicates the identity that does the MPI. Um, and the, the nature of the mac matching um, algorithms and, and what type of um, uh, technology, uh, probabilistic models or, or other types of um, uh, technology that you're using to actually secure those matches. Do you want me to give an attempt to answer that, Okay. Yes, please. Uh, everyone, okay. this is Alan Price, our technical architect. Hi. Uh, yes, the, um, the MPI is based on a uh, ARP. Our Truven Analytics is our contractor, but the product uh, solution and stack is from a company called Care Evolution. And their, um, their MPI, it's a proprietary MPI, and they use uh, both a probabilistic and deterministic algorithm to do the matching. And uh, we've had other sessions. If you're interested, we can get you more information on how the algorithm works, but it's a combination of deterministic and probabilistic. And the uh, way the um, there's a PIX manager that sits that manages the identities from different organizations that does the linking, and we we get reports. Uh, and we can look at them monthly about how well that linking's happening. So uh, and and the all the feeds to our P3N um, PIX manager or MPI are based on IHE standards. So when patients are registered, they use uh, the IHE standards for PIX feeds or HL7 ADT feeds, particular type of feeds to feed our MPI. And then also they use the same feeds for keeping the demographics um, uh, up to date and also for merging patients. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, and your next question comes from the line of Jeffrey Martinez. Yeah, hi, it's actually from Doug Powell who's here with me. Uh, yeah, hi. I was wondering um, if we have existing uh, interfaces for the state, we have an existing immunization, um, bidirectional, actually, with the state uh, interface, and we're soon to have a syndromic interface. How does this affect those existing interfaces, and will we be expecting to move them over and convert them to this model? Alan, would you be able to answer that for us? I think so. I think uh, right now uh, I bring up the public health gateway, which will create an opportunity for providers to then submit to the registries uh, through the HIOs, or they can continue using the existing uh, methods that they're using. But we're encouraging through the state to begin uh, thinking about using a single connection through an HIO for the for the four registry submissions and the CQM to our uh, submission to our uh, human services department. So um, you can keep uh, those current interfaces active. I think you'll be encouraged over time to think about moving to a single connection to an HIO and using that service. 
but there's no set timeline at this point. Well, there is some timelines for when these things will become available. Uh, for instance, uh, I know the HSX is in, in the onboarding process right now, and I think um, electronic lab reporting will be the first interface that will be available to the providers through, uh, through HSX, followed on, I think, with the uh, cancer uh, registry. I, I don't know if uh, Kay has in, in her slides anything about the timing, but by the end of the year, or by October, I believe, all four Department of Health registries will be available for submission through the HIO and through the P3N. Now, I, what I, I'm sorry, my apologies. Uh, what I've been referring to is the sunsetting of the current existing interfaces to move to this. Oh, so, I, I'm not aware of a, a date for that. Um, as far as I understand, that has not been uh, decided. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Tammy, Again, we'll if you would like to ask, I'm sorry, go ahead. If there are no other questions in the queue, I'd like to move on. Okay, we do have one more. All right, we'll take one more. Thank you. Okay, this question comes from the line of Colleen Saul. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the presentation. With regard, I actually have a question with regard to the Public Health Gateway. Uh, so we are struggling uh, to actually implement state because the state is so inundated with requests for meaningful use. Uh, and we can continue to keep that documentation in place, but we would be very interested in pursuing this. We did pilot uh, with HSX with regard to testing the functionality, and we would we would be very interested in pursuing that. And, and Colleen, we can talk with the state about how we can move that forward uh, through us, and I think we'd be happy to try to figure out the way to make that be, since you did all the pilot testing anyway, I'd love for you to be first in line to get the new uh, connection set up. I'd love that too. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Okay, Kay, we'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Those were very good questions. Um, it brings us back. Our next slide then was slide 14. Uh, this brings us into um, what could be a lengthy um, discussion here. It is on the consent management. Act 121 actually sets Pennsylvania as an opt-out state, meaning that patients are assumed to be in the system unless they otherwise affirmatively opt out. Consistent with state and federal law, patients must be notified about the connection to the P3N before the HIO can move into a production environment or a go live in the P3N. And there are a number of methods that are available for such patient notification. The authority actually leaves that decision up to the HIOs because it's based then on their business models. But perhaps the most efficient method and typically the most popular method is to update the notice of privacy practices just to alert the patients that their data may now be exchanged across other organizations. Act 121 also requires the authority to notify the patient once they are included in the opt-out registry or their status has otherwise changed. This notification includes a copy of the completed consent form signed by the patient with some of the data redacted, and in a couple of slides I can show you what that is. The notification is accompanied by a letter which, among other things, instructs the patients to contact the authority if they did not intend to change their consent status or if they have any questions. Slide 15 to continue. There are currently a few different ways for a patient to opt out. They may do so at their provider's office or they may do so directly through the authority. In cases where the patient completes the consent form in the provider's office, the provider is required to upload the signed form into their system. Providers may also use the Pennsylvania Patient Provider Network Provider Portal to change a patient's consent, and that likewise requires the consent form to be uploaded. In either case, this triggers a transaction to the P3N, which registers the change of consent and stores the opt-out form in the P3N consent registry. Limited authority staff have access to a daily consent report, 
which is used to enable the authority to download that form and then notify the patient accordingly. Patients may also choose to download the P3N opt-out form from the authority's website, and then they can return that signed form to us either via U.S. mail or a specific resource account that we have for email. When the authority receives an opt-out form, an authorized staff member here logs in to the P3N provider portal, accesses the MPI to see if that patient already exists in the system. If a definite match is found, meaning all provided demograph data matches exactly, then the staff member will upload that consent form and change the, the consent status as requested. If no match is found, the staff member would first have to register the patient in the MPI and then perform the consent status change. In cases where a possible or likely match is found, but some of the information is different, maybe a different street address or a different city, in those cases the authority would contact the patient to either confirm a match or identify that it is not a match and they need to register this person as a new patient in the MPI. If we determine that it's a definite match and we have that confirmation directly from the patient, then what we would do is register the patient with a new or corrected information as a new patient in the MPI, enter a support ticket to Truven, requesting that they link those two entries as a definite positive match. Once they're linked, then we would go back in and complete the consent management process. It's a lot of information, but I think our next couple of slides may help with that. Slide 16 actually shows the front side of our P3N consent form might be a little difficult to see. There's a lot of information here and it's fairly small, but they do show what this looks like. It is intended to be a single form that's used both for opting out of the P3N and opting back in to the P3N. It's designed to require the minimum data necessary to help ensure appropriate patient matching in the MPI. And you'll see here in this section one, there are three boxes that must be initialed if a patient chooses to opt out. These are mostly to verify the patient's understanding of the consent process and what it means to opt out, as well as their ability to opt back in at any time should they choose to do so. Section two, you'll see, has just a single box that must be initialed, and this is the section for patients that choose to opt back in. Section three of the form is where the demographic data is entered. And you can see here that the form requires the patient to include a first name, middle name, and last name, a date of birth, their full address, gender, and a phone number. The optional fields here include a second phone number, an email address, and the last four digits of the social security number. This form is available on our website, and it includes here at the bottom the authority's mailing address as well as the email address, so both options are available for sending this form in to us. When we actually send this form back to a patient who has changed their consent, we first redact the date of birth and the social security number if they happen to include it. And this is more for identity protection purposes. In the off chance that this form is sent back to them via US mail and the mail carrier puts it in the wrong mailbox or somebody else in that residence opens it, um, it does help protect their identity from identity theft as the information available would simply be the name and address. Side 17 then shows the back of the form. This contains the information on health information exchange in general and the P3N and is designed to meet the Act 121 requirements. 
Those Act 121 requirements are that the form must include, at a minimum and in plain language, the definition of a health information exchange, an explanation of the benefits of participation in a health information exchange, an explanation of the limits of the patient's ability to decline the release or exchange of their health information within the exchange, an explanation of the manner in which the HIE will address privacy issues, and an explanation of the manner in which the individual may decline to participate in the HIE. I'm going to move on to slide 18 now, and for this, turn it over to Pam to talk more specifically about consent management within HealthShare Exchange. Thank you, Kay. HealthShare Exchange has established our opt-out and opt-back-in policy, and it is aligned with the state's process. We have a committee, a privacy and security work group committee, as well as a clinical advisory committee, and we had our policies reviewed before they were published on our website. And this policy is currently out on our website with a frequently asked questions document that describes the opportunity for consumers to opt out. So essentially, if an individual in our region wanted to opt out of HSX, they could go onto our website and we do have a form that they could use for this purpose. We also accept the P3N form. So if a consumer completed the P3N form and submitted it to us, which has happened, we do process it accordingly. So individuals are able to opt out directly online uh, through the form that we have. They could print it out and send it to us via fax or through the mail. Once HSX receives an opt-out request, we have it processed within five days, but do it as soon as we can. I want to be clear, although we are not going through our use cases on this particular WebEx and educational program, that some of the use cases that we have in production and the technology that we use for those services today are not available for patient opt-out. So we have a use case where we deploy direct secure messaging and HSX in those instances acts as a conduit. So we cannot prevent those messages from being sent from one entity to another and we are not opening the messages so we don't know what patient information is contained in them. We are not able to offer the opt-out for any direct services. Our encounter notification service, ENS, also leverages the direct technology. And similarly, there is not an opportunity for an individual to opt out of that service. In addition, per our policy, if there is a legal requirement for data sharing and reporting, individuals cannot out, opt out of that either. So examples of that would be some services that have already been mentioned on this call, such as the immunization reporting or the reporting of certain laboratory results. We do have the opportunity for consumers to opt back in and that would, of course, supersede any previous opt-out for an individual. There are the same mechanisms for opting back in, online, fax, or mail, as there are for opting out. I want to let you know we have received some opt-outs. We have processed them, but at this point in time, because we do not have our clinical data repository available, there is nothing for an individual to be opted out of in actuality, but once we have that clinical data repository available, those individuals who have been opted out, we will honor those opt-outs. I'll turn it back to you, Kay. Okay, thank you, Pam. Slide 19 moves us into the provider directory, the next service in the P3N. The P3N provider directory includes both individual and organizational categories classified by provider type, specialties, demographics, and service locations. It is available through the P3N provider portal, 
and it's based on three key data sources. The National Plan and Provider Enumeration System, or NPEVS, Pennsylvania Department of Health licensure data, and the Pennsylvania Department of State licensure data. It includes the license information, such as status and expiration dates, as well as the source of the information, and it can accommodate direct email addresses as well. Um, I don't have anything more on this, Alan. I don't know if there were any additional points you would like to bring out on the provider directory. Um, it's a pretty high-level service for us. Uh, one one common question that, that's asked of us is the ability to uh, download the provider directory. And at this time, uh, that is not uh, possible. We have a change request in with our vendor, Truven, to uh, determine when we're going to make that available. So the only thing that we have available to um, is to import. As, uh, as Case pointed out, there's three sources that we import into our provider directory, and we're also asking our HIOs to contribute to a provider directory. So today, we can only import and to do a, to have the ability to do it like an export of the entire directory for whatever purposes uh, through an interface that's not available. But the entire directory is available through our web client. Okay, thank you, Alan. On slide 19, um, Pam, I will turn it back to you. Yes, so as you can see on slide 20, there is a graph that shows how HSX's provider directory has grown since its uh, inception. And we take very good care of the provider directory as we develop it. We did develop our standard for how uh, individuals submit their entries for the provider directory. We based it on the authorities so that we will be aligned with what they will require for us to share our provider directory with them at such time as when we would be contracted with the authority. As you can see from the provider directory, we have many of our members that have contributed direct addresses to us. This is a very um, organized process whereby on a weekly basis, the members and participants share with us any updates or changes to their directory panels, and then we incorporate them into our provider directory, and we share that provider directory out with all those entities that are currently exchanging data with us through Direct. If you notice, there was an increase in the provider directory, but then a slight decrease in May, and that's because uh, we identified that some of the entries in our provider directory, although the physicians may have had direct addresses, that in fact they were not active, and so we had to take them out of our directory because we want to make sure that if individuals are using our directory that they will actually be able to be sending messages and have them be received by those providers who they are sending those messages to. So we do, as I said, take a very concerted effort to ensure uh, that our white pages are real and we update it on a weekly basis. We can move on to governance and certification. Thank you, Pam. That starts us into slide 21. To ensure the privacy and security of patients' protected health information, as well as the integrity of the P3N, the authority is charged with maintaining a certification process for HIOs who participate in the P3N. This certification package and the process itself are driven by the HIO community, and we've just recently finished working with this group of stakeholders to develop what we refer to as version three, or V3, of the certification package. This package includes an application for participation, the participation agreement itself, or the PAR, technical requirements, and a series of policies that are designed to make sure that all participants and the authority are HIPAA compliant. By signing the PAR and returning it to the authority, 
along with some additional documents that are required by the application itself, the HIO is committing to exchange data according to interoperability standards as well as the privacy and security policies. Returning the signed PAR also allows the HIO to begin the process of onboarding to the P3N, which involves a series of interoperability tests. Once all tests have been completed, the PAR has been fully executed, and the patients have been notified, then the HIO is moved into the production environment where some additional data validation tests are run, and once that's all complete, the HIO is considered fully certified by the authority, and we're all good to go. It's important to note here that the PAR, and indeed the entire certification package, is a multi-party agreement. This means that all HIOs sign and commit to the same agreement and the same policies. HealthShare Exchange has been a very key member of the work groups that were formed to complete the version three work. Um, Daniel, um, you and Pam were both very active on that. Is there anything either of you would like to add about the certification process before we move on to more of the trust community committee? No, I think that, that we, uh, HealthShare Exchange has been active. Pam has been taking the participation agreement. I've been taking the certification uh, discussions, and we've been putting our, our thoughts into it along with the other HIOs in the state. And so it's been a very collaborative uh, uh, group that has been working together for some time now, since I think early January. I think it's been, <laughs> it feels like it's been forever. But uh, we're making steady progress, and I think we'll be wrapping this thing up pretty soon on both, both sides. Yeah, and I just also want to mention that for HealthShare Exchange, our attorney, Jill Circus from Cooper and Levinson has been very involved in the negotiation of the participation agreement with the authority. Yes, very much so. And it, it was really um, a long process, but I think all of the HIOs, it just came together as a very collaborative group, and it made it a very enjoyable process along the way. On slide 22, I wanted to touch briefly on what we call the HIO, HIE Trust Community Committee, or HIETCC. The P3N and the HIO stakeholder community is governed by this committee. As such, we actually require all certified participants in the P3N to have at least one individual participate on this committee and this committee is actually chartered to advise the authority on certification requirements, processes, compliance management, um, it's chartered to develop and approve reporting requirements, and it also is, is going to be critical in reporting and taking action if a breach were to occur at any level. Um, in this year, Daniel Wilt is actually the chair of that committee, and as such is uh, very critical in making sure we keep the committee on track at its monthly meetings. Uh, Daniel, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add there. No, so it's a it's a voluntary spot. Obviously, I volunteered uh, the, this year to help uh, chair it, and then at some point it'll switch to somebody else, and so it's a rotating basis, and it's not a permanent spot, and so I'm just helping to facilitate some of that stuff. And I say the the big thing for us now is that. The committee actually has admitted two new uh, two new people to the to the group. Uh, Kihai and Clinical Connect uh, have come on board officially, and now they're part of that community is in that discussion. So we have all the players kind of now in that meeting uh, once a month and and talking about what what we want to get accomplished with the state. So it's a very collaborative group again, um, and basically a lot of the same players that we were talking about the par and the certification pieces. But um, it's been a good team to kind of walk through a whole bunch of stuff with. So, and I great support from the staff at P3N actually does most of the work for me, and I just kind of, they get prep me for the meeting, and I show up, and we go through the topic. So, uh, between Alan and Kay, they, they uh, help run that for, uh, for, the, for the state. Okay. So let's change over now to slide 23. Now that we've talked about the P3N services and the collaboration between the authority and HSX, and some, and some HSX specific services as well. Let's talk a little bit about the value of the partnership between the HIOs and the authority. 
In an ever-changing healthcare environment, wrestling with how to modernize delivery and finance, we actually try to provide unique and tangible benefits to the HIO community. And we do this by bridging that public-private sector gap and providing a common governance framework. The authority also serves as a neutral convener and facilitator of the HIOs, healthcare provider groups, government agencies, and the broader public to achieve statewide and interstate electronic health information exchange. And the authority plays a critical role in creating and maintaining the P3N, which is the thin layer of technical services necessary to make those connections and enable the exchange. Slide 24, and there are many benefits to this partnership, many of which we've already discussed. This, I think, is, is kind of a brief recap of some of those benefits. One, we have the certification program that we've discussed, which ensures that all participating HIOs are operating on a level playing field with regard to interoperability standards, privacy, and security. It builds on the existing investments from the HIOs themselves and on industry best practices. It also provides a unified legal framework. So by signing that single multi-party participation agreement, the HIOs avoid the cost and the complexity of creating and maintaining multiple legal agreements with each of the other HIOs. There are grant programs as well. The authority supports the HIOs in their development of onboarding efforts with funds that are exclusively available to the certified HIOs and we're always pursuing other additional federal grants at every opportunity to try to get more help in supporting the HIOs. And then there's the statewide patient consent management piece, which we've discussed earlier, a single, easily accessed repository for patients opt out and opt back in choices across the P3N using the statewide authority opt out, opt back in form, which is available to all HIOs and connected providers. Slide 25 continues on with the statewide patient identity management, achieving global patient identification, enabling that consent management and the clinical document exchange. The public health gateway, enabling the one-stop shop connection to various government agencies and the reporting services. An authoritative state-level provider directory, centralized directory with state license or data facilitated clinical document exchange for or on behalf of those HIOs using XDS and responses to XCA for those not using XDS. We have the HIE trust community as we've spoken about and we also have a HISP trust community, both of which allow, enable collaboration without any antitrust concerns. And on slide 26, we include also the stakeholder committee facilitation. Um, we have a number of stakeholder committees uh, at this point that are engaging on a lot of important issues. One of our premier ones right now is um, actually a committee that is working on super protected data. And then there's the ongoing interstate electronic health information exchange engagement efforts. We are currently talking with several of our neighboring states who very much want to connect with us. Um, we've identified plenty of areas where patients cross state borders between Pennsylvania and Delaware, Maryland, Ohio, West Virginia, and others, and we're trying to facilitate those conversations to make that a little more available to everyone. Uh, Pam, I'm going to move on to slide 27 and 28, which talk about some of our advocacy efforts and turn this to you for a bit. Thank you, Kay. Before I talk about the legislative advocacy efforts, I do want to mention that HealthShare Exchange has two members of our Board of Trustees that also currently sit on the authorities board. And I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of that. So Martin Chickichop, 
who is a vice president for the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, is on the HSX board and the authority board. And then, of course, HSX's chair, Dr. Richard Snyder, who is the chief medical officer of Independence Blue Cross, also represents us on the authority board. So we do have a voice at the authority level in addition to Daniel, who already mentioned that he is the chair of that committee. Uh, we actually have representation on the board. In terms of legislative advocacy, if we move to slide 28, there's specific ask that we have of all of you. If you would be willing to contact your legislator, it would be very important because we're looking for there to be a full $4.7 million appropriation in this budget so that the PA eHealth Partnership Authority can do what it is expected to do and fulfill its obligation under Act 121, which Kay walked us through at the beginning of this call. It would be critical to support the health information exchange opportunities in Pennsylvania, as has been described today. As you are aware HSX is working toward and wants to participate with the Pennsylvania Patient and Provider Network, the P3N, which is the vehicle for electronic health information exchange in the Commonwealth. We believe that that will provide faster access to clinical results for patients who are seen across the state. It could reduce redundancy of medical tests, facilitate smoother transitions, and of course, hopefully prevent any avoidable and unnecessary readmissions, and expand the public health monitoring and tracking. So what I wanted to let everyone know is that for all of you who have registered with this call, you will be receiving a copy of the slide deck after the call along with a sample letter that you can send to your legislators. Slide 29. Slide 29 talks about the authority and HSX collaboration. So we are working together through the authorities committee process to determine and try and eliminate any barriers to super protected data information sharing. And the super protected data categories are HIV AIDS, mental health, and drug and alcohol for the state. We are working in concert, as you can tell by today's presentation, to establish joint education programs and themes and to develop outreach tools. There's a consumer committee that our public relations staff person, Russ Allen, participates on and has worked on developing consumer education tools. Also, uh, we are working to ensure that we do outreach in concert with the state to consumers and providers and make sure that our messages are similar so that consumers have an understanding of what, of what health information exchange is. HSX developed our consumer brochure and it is uh, modeled after the states. We have um, a national dialogue and conversations with both CMS and the Office for National Coordinator uh, around what we believe is important for health information exchange and what we need to support health information exchange here in Pennsylvania. And so we work together in advocacy efforts uh, and we provide input on regulations that are de being developed. And HSX has been very active in the plenary sessions that the authority has hosted annually and in other meetings that they have to ensure that we are working uh, to better provide clinical care for the patients that we serve here in the Commonwealth. So at this point, I'd like to open it up to final questions and comments from those of you who have been so good to participate on this call. So Tammy, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, at this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, press star then the number one on your telephone keypad.
Again, that is star and the number one on your telephone keypad. And your first question comes from the line of Gordon Zeiss. Gordon Zeiss from the city of Philadelphia. Yes, Gordon. Hi, it's Laura again. <laughs> hey, Laura Rip. It's okay. Hi. Hi. Okay, so you know the the interaction with consumers is always the most um, you know tangled part of this big web and. Um, in terms of first their understanding and then, you know, how they manage in terms of, you know, the consent and really being knowledgeable about what it is that they're signing up for or not signing up for. And I just wondered, um, particularly on the authentication of the consumer, you have three mechanisms to uh, engage them in discussions about opt-out or, you know, maybe even to just um, clarify or to opt back in, you know, online and mail and um, I forgot the third one, phone. Um, what authentication yeah. mechanisms? Um, what authentication mechanisms uh, have been incorporated in there to ensure that you know that the the patient or the consumer is who they say they are? So when we receive at HSX level, when we receive a request for an opt out, then we do contact that consumer directly. So we use the identifying information that they have provided on the form uh, to ensure that it is in fact the individual themselves. Um, that is opting out. And then we send a, a confirmation letter to them so that if they request that, it. That identifying information would be a phone number? Correct. Okay. okay. And Pam, if I could add to that as well, um, the one other way a patient may be able to opt out would be to log on to the P3N patient portal, which is I, I say this kind of tongue-in-cheek, it is almost available, technology is there, and it's capable of being used. Yeah. We have not made that live and available for patients yet for just that purpose. It's because we need to first really understand, um, are we going to use very specific two-factor authentication to make sure that that's the right patient logging in to manage their own consent? And how do we do that and still provide the ease of use that the general public would like to have? So it's a problem we're still working on together as a community to try to figure out. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate your understanding about um, what it means to to truly authenticate. I think that's a it's a challenge. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Could I ask one follow-up question? If a patient opts, opts out at the state level, are they automatically opted out at lower HIO levels, or do they have to opt out multiple times with multiple groups? So that's a great question, Gordon. And when uh, an individual opts out with the P3N, they are opted out with the P3N. So when HSX is connected to the P3N, then a patient could opt out at the P3N level and be opted out for HSX. Uh, however, Right now, it's, it's a dual process because we are not connected with the state. So an individual would have to opt out with the state and with HSX. Mm. Thank you. Again, if you would like to ask a question, press star then the number one on your telephone keypad. And your next question comes from the line of Andrew Forella. Hi, can you talk a little bit more about you mentioned earlier in the call about connecting to states. You know, as you know, in southeastern Pennsylvania, there's a need to connect to New Jersey and Delaware most, you know, most urgently. Sorry, ignore that. Uh, most urgently, given their proximity to us, and we certainly have patients and, in fact, sites that, you know, clinical care locations in New Jersey. So can you talk a little bit more about where you are with that process? Sure, Andy Farella from CHOP. Thank you for that question. So HSX has had direct conversations with both Delaware and New Jersey HIEs regarding connecting to them. And as Kay mentioned, the state is having conversations also about connectivity outside of Pennsylvania. But I'll, I'll let Daniel speak to the status of where we are at HSX level with some of the HIE connectivity. Uh, I think the, the predicates itself on the fact that we have a lot of work here in Southeast PA to get our hospital systems connected. And so 
Uh, one thing that we do want to make sure that we, when we do start to have those conversations, we have something to share that's worth uh, on their side. And so part of that is now uh, part, starting to get there, and so we've gotten some data in there. Uh, but we've talked with Delaware and Maryland and uh, Camden Coalition and uh, in South Jersey and, and uh, Virtua and, and others. And, and so I think they're, they're kind of saying, well, when you guys are ready, uh, then we can start to have a, a broader conversation. I think we're just about to the point where we could have those conversations and start to kind of push forward on that stuff. Uh, but that's just part of our thinking. It's not like we're spending a lot of time uh, on it right this second, but that will eventually become a much bigger portion of it because we know that the patient flows across the river are quite, quite, uh, quite a number of those happen, uh, and we re we do realize that, that South Jersey is important to the membership. So part of it's a timing issue, and as our members are aware, we really have been trying to get the admission discharge transfer messages from our hospitals. Right now, we have 18 hospitals that are sending those to us. We should be up to 22 shortly, but I think that those entities like Delaware would like to be able to uh, be a recipient of those ODT messages and vice versa, so we know when patients present to Delaware hospitals and they know when they present to ours. Like uh, similarly, we thought that that would be a good use case for the Camden Coalition to uh, take advantage of the Encounter Notification Service. Um, and also, as soon as our members are um, sharing the um, discharge information summaries, um, then we'll be able to also be populating our clinical data repository with those. So we would have a richer source for those outside HIEs to take advantage of and to connect um, for. So, Kay, anything further on the state side with uh, interstate connectivity? Uh, I think that the best way to sum it up from my perspective, and then I'll turn it over to Alan, I handle more along the certification and the, the legal processes of it. I think where we're at is we're going to find that the longest part of the process is in negotiating the agreements between the two states. Um, private sector, as you know, is typically a little bit easier to deal with from a legal perspective than a state government is. So I suspect that's going to be a, a, probably one of our biggest roadblocks in this. But we are starting to look at those agreements now. Um, from a technical perspective, I'll let Alan address that. Uh, yes, thank you, Kay. Uh, we are talking, uh, I guess we're in the um, most conversations with West Virginia and Ohio right now. Uh, and they're both part of uh, an organization called Healthy Way. And they've signed uh, a single multi-party agreement with them, but Pennsylvania has not. But we're looking at uh, getting agreements with those states, maybe using the Healthy Way Agreement. As uh, Kay said, that's the longest uh, lead time uh, effort in connecting uh, up to organizations across states is the, is the, uh, the agreements. And the technology seems to be pretty well flushed out. Uh, both uh, Healthy Way uh, offers like the, these connection options that we're talking to West Virginia and um, Ohio about. So it sounds like connecting them technically is going to be fairly straightforward, but the agreements are going to take longer. And our intention is to try to get them on board this year with the state of Pennsylvania. Now, it's New Jersey, I think HSX has had more conversation with their bordering states uh, than we have. We've talked to Delaware, who has an interest in joining the P3N, but they're that's about all we've heard from Delaware so far. New Jersey, very limited conversations. New York, very limited conversations. And Maryland, very limited conversations. So I think that HSX is probably ahead of us in, in conversing with those states for joining the network. Any other questions, Tammy? There are no further questions at this time. Okay, well, thank it, thanks to everyone, to Kay and to Alan from the authority, uh, and to all of you who listened to this presentation and asked questions, made comments. We appreciate it. If you have any additional questions, uh, you can certainly email them to me, pam.clark, C-L-A-R-K-E, at hsxsepa.org, and we'll be happy to follow up with you. Uh, we will be sending out the presentation, as I mentioned, along with a sample letter for you to send to your legislators asking for support for the appropriation for the authority. 
Have a great afternoon. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect. Presenters, please stand by.